you may be seated. Thank you all for joining us this morning at a very difficult moment for all of us. I'd like to uh, ask Kazan Rosner if he will begin this service for us with the beautiful 23rd Psalm. Nismul David Adonai v'rohil lo echzar Inot eshe yar b'tseini Amei menuchut yinhaleini Nafshi yishohev yonheini v'magle tzedek Lemon Shmo Tamaki Elech Begetzavet Lohira Raki Atha Imadi she <laughs> Kosi Revaya Achto Vachesed Yedefuni Kol Yemei Chayai Veshavti Bevet Adonai Le'orech yamim. The Psalm of David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. Thou prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Dear friends, I ask the Chazan to chant the 23rd Psalm, because at this moment, I feel that we are all part of the same family. I feel that all of us are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And so we are here not just to walk together, but as it says in the psalm, ki ata imadi, because as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me, you are with me. And we're here to lean on each other, to be with each other as we walk this path. None of us want to be here. But if we must be here, we must be here together. That's the case at this moment. It will be the case during Shiva. Yatai Madi. 
we take our lead from God to be with each other. There's a story in the Torah referenced a couple of times, the book of Leviticus, which uh, envisions two sons of uh, the high priest Aaron, Nadav and Avihu, getting ready to uh, offer a sacrifice as their father, the high priest, looks on. The boys are uh, Nadav and Avihu. They're excited because they will one day assume the roles of high priest, which their father has occupied from the beginning. And then something happens. The Torah doesn't tell us what. All it says is that from the heavens, a fire comes forth and burns and incinerates both boys in front of their father. And it's the response of Aaron at that moment, which I reference and which I recommend to us all. The Torah says of Aaron, Vayidom, he saw what occurred and he was silent. Silent because what he might have said might have been inappropriate. Maybe he was silent because he didn't know the words to say. Or maybe he was silent simply because he could not fathom what was happening. I'd like to ask that we begin today in the spirit of Aharon HaKohen, Aaron the High Priest, with, let us begin with silence before words of eulogizing are spoken. Silence is our first response. But there are things that must be said, and I want to invite some of the family members to speak and to remember Jonathan Loeb. There are many here who could speak, and many friends, I presume, would love to share stories and memories not all the stories and memories, but some of them. And they will have that opportunity to do so during Shiva. At this moment, however, I would like to call upon the family that would like to address us, beginning with uh, Jonathan's father, Dan. It's hard to believe that our son Jonathan has left us. It's not right for a boy to go before his parents. Oh, Bob, you can you do it. Bob, you can. Dan's words here. But if my to learn anything from this tragedy, it's the measure of man's life is not the number of years or months, but how he fills that time. 
God didn't simply mark his time on earth. He lived. He lived his life to his fullest with passion for all those around him. And his passion was contagious. As a toddler, John could shout out in joy and could dance passionately into the night until exhaustion and sleep overtook him. In elementary school, he was passionate about rocks and minerals. He would collect gems and crystals wherever he went and eventually converted our hall closet into the Jonathan Loeb Rocking Rock Museum, complete with his own website detailing the rocks. Many of the visitors to our house were delighted that they got the curated tour of his collection and surprised to be solicited to endow the future expansions of his rock collection. His passion infected several of the other boys in his class who would often see John and his, and his minions spending their recess at the Perlman Day School, chiseling in, their, uh, in vain at the boulder in front of the school. His passion for technology began in middle school. He loved trying out the latest gadgets. Once he programmed his phone to take control of the TV in the classroom at uh, Seligman, along with a couple other kindred spirits, John founded Jitsik and produced a, the MacHeads, a YouTube channel with millions of page views and created all sorts of cool iPhone apps. Truly really amazing. His role model was Apple's Steve Jobs at least until he learned about Tesla that became his greatest passion along with its founder, Elon Musk. He worked with Helen on a high-tech startup to help overcome people overcome their fear of self-driving cars. He corresponded with Musk and eventually met his hero and enjoyed a private tour of the Tesla uh, factory in SpaceX. John's dream of becoming the next Steve Jobs or Musk would, were suddenly dashed when he was diagnosed with cancer almost four years ago. And for a while, he struggled with a lack of purpose. But eventually, he found his Bashert, Rachel Edelman, and their love for each other was so deep that I feel that they were destined for each other. They only had a short time together, but they made the most of it. Never wait to tell someone that you love them or that you're sorry because you never know what tomorrow will bring. A month ago, John told his girlfriend, Rachel, you mean so much to me. I want, want nothing more than to spend the rest of my life with you. Will you marry me? And she said, of course. And John said later that day, that was the happiest day of his life. I'm very grateful for John for bringing Rachel into our lives and to Rachel Edelman for filling John's life with so much love and unbounded, unbounded joy and so much strength. Johnny, our dear Johnny, we love you so much and we'll miss you forever. Thank you, thank you, Dan, for your words. Helen, I'll ask you to come. My dear friends, my dear family, and my beloved Jonathan, thank you all for coming to honor the memory of my wonderful, incredible, phenomenal son, Jonathan Mimun Lobb. I want to thank God here for the wonderful 27 years I got to spend with Jonathan. His name, God has given, says it all. He was a gift to all who knew him. 
When Gabby was born, I became a mother. It was a wonderful experience. Yet when John was born, my mothering skill had to reach a totally new level. I want to share a few of some parenting stories with you. When John was four years old, I woke up one particular morning to wake John up for preschool. I could not find him in his bed. I could not find him in his room or his sister's room. I checked every nook and cranny of the house and to my surprise, I found him comfortably sleeping on the top shelf of the linen's closet. A shelf that I cannot even reach. Every day I opened John's room, I was in for a surprise. John was always unpredictable. He was a present to us every single day of his life. Once, when one John was eight, it was 11 p.m. We finally had the kids in bed. I was in bed. And all of a sudden, the door to my room, to my, the master bedroom, burst open. And John marching in, singing, on top of his lungs. I can't recall if I laughed or cried that night. Fast forward a few years to when John is in elementary school. He's going through his rock phase. After learning about pie chart in school, the students are assigned to make projects. They interview each other about their favorite color, their favorite food, so as to make a pie chart. My Jonathan interviews his fellow students about their very favorite profession. Rock collector, miner, cave explorator, and then he draws his pie chart. Rock collector, 0%, miner, 0%, cave explorator, 0%, and other, 100%. <laughs> He had a unique passion about everything he did. Middle school filled a treasure trove of memories. It brought his lot of pink slips and phone calls from the principal. We decided to throw a graduation party in our basement and invite his entire middle school class. I told John there would be, of course, no alcohol, and I didn't want any of the furniture or anything in the basement damaged. He gave me his word, and I let him prepare for the party. A couple of hours later, I went down to the basement to check to find that all the furniture had been pushed into the unfinished part of the basement including the piano. All decoration had been taken all the wall. Um, once again, I wasn't sure whether to laugh or cry. This was my John. This is my John. He was all or nothing with him. The big surprise in high school came one day during parent-teacher conference, and I hear the math teacher tell me that John is totally ready for a PhD in math. He had been teaching himself through YouTube videos and filled several notebooks with high level math color coded in many colors. His incredibility, incredible ability to teach himself was yet another side of John we didn't see coming. I could go on with stories. We adored John. His friends adored him. His fiancée adores him. 
John, I have always been proud of you. Your sensitivity was known to others. When your sister Rachel was born, my friend brought you to the hospital. As we one rushed to see the cute baby, Rachel, but John, you rushed towards me to ask me if I was okay. John, I love you. I am proud of you. You made me a better mom, a better person, to make the world a better place. I'll now ask John's, uh, let's see, John's aunt, John's aunt, Danielle, who came in last night from London with Lorette and uh, Gabby. She wanted to say a few words as well, and we welcome her. I'm glad she was able to come. Danielle? Um, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, I'm happy I've been authorized to come here, my mom, because in this time of COVID, frontiers are not open and we needed a national interest exemption. Unfortunately, this wasn't granted to all the French cousins. Uh, we call us the Dream Cruise Team. So they are online here and they're together and they would so much have liked to be here. My son, Johan, sent a message and I'm going to read it in French and give you the translation into English. En mon nom, Johan Boussel, cousin de Jonathan Maimon Loeb. In my name, Johan Boussel, cousin of Jonathan Maimon Loeb. Tu es depuis mes premiers souvenirs autant mon meilleur ami que mon cousin. John, you are since my first memories, as much my best friend as my cousin. La distance qui nous séparait était une épreuve qui nous rapprochait. The distance that separated us was a test that brought us closer. We have always loved each other deeply. Nous nous sommes toujours profondément aimés. Nous partagions les mêmes passions et les mêmes rêves. We shared the same passions and the same dreams. Mais toi, Johnny, tu étais un visionnaire, but you, Johnny, were a visionary. Tu ressentais le monde de demain et tu y investissais corps et âme. You could envision the world of tomorrow and you invested your heart and soul in it. Jitsik and Tesla are living proof of that. Jitsik and Tesla are the proof of that. You are the human the most attachant that I have had the chance to know. You are the most endearing human being I have ever had the chance to know. You were always loyal and invested in those you considered as your loved ones. Tu as toujours été loyal et investi auprès de ceux que tu considérais comme tes proches. 
Tu savais apprécier les choses simples de la vie. You knew how to appreciate the simple things in life. A good bath, bath tub, bath tub, please. <laughs> Hot tub, I mean. Um, so a good bath, contemplating the landscape, clapping your hands, bump on the hour, or a good hug, good music. Un bon bain, contempler les paysages, taper dans ses mains, à leur pile, un bon câlin, de la bonne musique. You are my model of humanity and success. Tu es mon modèle d'humanité et de réussite. Au nom des trois mousquetaires, tu es le plus vaillant et combattant d'entre nous. In the name of the three musketeers, you are the most valiant and the best fighter among us. And here I'm just going to tell you that I think it happened here in this very synagogue when uh, it was Gabi's Maramidva, our little boys, the dream cousins, Jonathan, Johan and David were like six, eight and something. And uh, they came to the Teba called and uh, they, they, you know, like pretend fighting. And since then, we call them the Musketeers. All our lives, we will serve your memory. Toute notre vie, nous servirons ta mémoire. Les trois mousquetaires ne disparaîtront jamais. Tu as gravé à vie, tu es gravé à vie dans nos têtes et sur nos corps. David égale John égale Johan. The three musketeers will never disappear. You are engraved for life in our heads and on our bodies. David equals John equals Johan. You taught, you taught us life, we owe you. Tu nous as appris la vie, nous te sommes redevables. Tu étais une personne hors du commun, Johnny. You were an, an extraordinary person, Johnny. Rest in peace. We love you. And we'll serve your memory for the rest of our life. Repose en paix, nous t'aimons, et nous servirons ta mémoire le restant de notre, le restant de notre vie. Un pour tous, tous pour un. One for all, all for one. I love you. Je t'aime, Johan. Thank you, Danielle, for Thank you, John. I guess silence is one response. Clapping is one response. But there are some words also with which I feel we must respond. And I thank uh, Dan for his words and Helen and Danielle for reading the beautiful words in French and thank you for translating them. For, uh, for me, I think everyone else understood. Part of the words that must be spoken are words of condolence. To you, Dan, and you, Helen, I extend condolences on behalf of all of those that are here. To Gabby, Benjamin, Rachel, this loss is immeasurable. I know that each of you had a special relationship with your brother and that throughout your life you will always keep that, his memory and the wonderful 
experiences that you shared with him in your hearts. I want to uh, extend condolences to uh, Jonathan's friends. There are lots of them here today. If John had a particular personal skill that could be mentioned, it would be his ability to find his friends and to be completely devoted to them. And I think they all know that uh, his love of them and all the things that they did and all the trips that they took and all the places that they visited will always be kept in their hearts as memories of the fun and the joy and the dedication of Jonathan as their friend. As you have also heard, there's a special friend, now fiance. Rachel, this is, I know how difficult this is for you. You've been traveling with John for a while and certainly these last three and a half years, you and he have been fellow travelers, you accompanying him through every step of his illness, his chemotherapy, his his medications, and his recoveries time and time again. I do want to say that a few weeks ago, John had prepared this wonderful surprise from his uh, bed, just having come out of ICU. And we got to see it uh, on a uh, a quick film that was sent, and I'm sure that's available to many of you, and you've seen it. Rachel didn't know exactly what to expect, but there was a surprise, and she walked into his room, which was, cut, which was filled with balloons and with flowers and decorated, and Rachel went to Jonathan's bedside where he proposed marriage, and she accepted. And Rachel, I bring that up not only because it was a wonderful memory, but as you were standing there, I was looking at Jonathan's face. And I want you to know that you brought more light and more joy, and more pleasure to, to John than anyone else in the world. And it was all radiating from his face from his hospital bed on that very day. I hope you'll keep that with you as well. I also want to mention the devotion of this community. And I mentioned this to Dan and to Helen also. In the past three and a half years since Jonathan uh, was diagnosed, His name has been included in every Mishaberach that we have said in this community, every prayer for healing. And if you want to know if these ancient prayers work, I can tell you this, they worked for us. They worked for those who said them, they worked for those who knew that we were saying them. They were strengthened by them with an illness that nobody could predict would last for three and a half years. Maybe a few months, maybe a year, maybe a little more, not three and a half. That all of those prayers provided the strength that he needed to live all of those extra days, those were gifts. I think, Rachel, you used that word. And I'm very glad that we could share that love and strength and those prayers together with his family and with John. 
There's a story that uh, is told in the book of Samuel, which quotes a wise woman, we don't even have her name, that uh, King David went to this wise woman for, for advice. And he wanted to know, know about life, the meaning of life, the things all of us want to know. And she responded to him with an interesting depiction of life. She said, Ki mot namut v'chamayim nigramim arza, asher lo ye asfu. She said to King David, you know, we're all going to die. Mot namut, we'll all die. And our lives will be like water spilled onto parched earth which can never be gathered again. And frankly, if she was looking to comfort King David, I think that at least initially, it seems like she may have been a little callous and uh, not very hopeful. But as I think about this story, it seems to me that it's the opposite. Our lives are like water spilled on earth when we die, and if we allow it to happen, then that water disappears and is never heard from or never known again. But everywhere that that water is poured potentially provides food and nourishment to the seeds that have been planted. And it's those seeds that we plant during our lives that provide for us the longevity and sense of meaning that I think we look for in life. Our lives are like water spilling on parched earth, but below that parched earth are the seeds of our accomplishments and the trials and the, the projects that we have worked on. John's life was one of those in which there were so many seeds planted, an endless number of projects based on his passions and his potential. He was an entrepreneur, not just, not just because he said so, but that was exactly the name of the program that he was in at Drexel, an entrepreneur program. And there were many different projects that he was involved with. And uh, he may have become another Steve Jobs or Elon Musk, a virtual reality headset to teach people how to drive and how to be safe in a car. He worked in Tel Aviv and was in Israel quite a bit, working on startups in a land that he loved. John was a, a computer lover and designer, a geek in the best sense of the word, a technology geek, a Mac computer geek. He developed a website, 32,000 uh, people have subscribed to it. He was a math whiz. I remember going uh, to uh, the Loeb's, I don't remember the occasion. I remember going to the Loeb's house when John was small, maybe five, six, seven years old, something like that. And I knew what a Rubik's Cube was. And I had tried to show my kids at one point, it goes like this, and then I said, no, you just make sure there are a lot of colors on each of the sides. I was able to do that. But when I came to John, without looking, I, I don't know, without looking, he went like this and completely solved the puzzle. I don't know what that would have led to, but it was sure impressive that a young kid could do that, or maybe deeply unimpressive that I couldn't. But John was, pa was passionate about his interests. He loved trucks when he would, construction trucks when he was young. 
and that switched over to Tesla, as you know. As he got older, I have a feeling all of these things would have been developed and would have been sources of joy for him in the life he should have been living. And I think this comes into our role here. I think it's our job to remember. I think it's our job to water and nurture the seeds that he planted that his, to make sure that his life is not a once and done, like water poured on parched earth. His life should be for us just the beginning, a life in which his interests and his passions are recalled and remembered fondly. It's our responsibility to assure that these seedlings grow and flourish and live on as a testament to the life of Jonathan Loeb, Yonatan Mimun Ben Daniel El Hanan Visimcha. Tihi Zichro Baruch. May his memory always remain for us a blessing. We, uh, before we conclude our services, Rabbi uh, Yona Gross is here, and I know it would uh, mean a lot if you would, would you say a psalm for us? Something. Rabbi Gross is the senior rabbi at Beth Medrash, just our neighboring synagogue. Yona. Ilim Perek Tesvav, Psalm 15. Is Merle David Adonai Mia Gorbi Halecha, Mi Shkon Bahar Kachecha. Sojourns in your tent who may dwell in your holy mountain, Holech Tomim Ufal Tzedek, Vedover Mesbil Vavo, who walks in purity, does what is righteous, and speaks truth from the heart. Lo Ragala Lishono Lo Asalerehu Ra'a, Vecherpa Lo Nasa Al Krovo. He has no slander on his tongue, nor has done harm to his fellow, and cast, nor de cast disgrace towards his neighbor. Does nothing to cause personal hurt to anybody, doesn't retract on their word, doesn't lend money with interest, nor take a bribe against the innocent. And with us, from all these things, will never falter. Thank you, Rabbi Gross. El Shaddai, almighty God of the living and the dead, send comfort to your children who grieve, overcome by the pain of loss. They need your help to focus on the triumph and the joy in the life of Jonathan Loeb. Help them to meet grief with courage to face sorrow undaunted. Help them to treasure what is theirs because Jonathan has lived. Should despair threaten or faith falter, sustain us all, Adonai, for you are our refuge and strength, our ever-present help in troubled times. May we say amen. Please rise. El Malir Achamim, Shochein Bamromim, Hametzei Minucha Nechona, Tachat Kanfei Ashkina, Malot Kedoshim Odorim, Kizorakiyamazhirim. 
Et nishma Jonathan Maimon ben Daniel Hanan ve Simcha Shalach le'olamo Tegan Eden temenuchato Nabal harachamim Aftirehu besir kenofecha Le'olamim Utro v'itro Achayim nishmato Aronai v'nachlato Yanuh v'shalom Alami ishkavo V'nomar El Rachamim, exalted, compassionate God, grant infinite rest in your sheltering presence among the holy and the pure to the soul of Jonathan Loeb, who has gone to his eternal home. Merciful one, we ask that our loved one find perfect peace in your eternal embrace. May his soul be bound up in the bond of life. May he rest in peace. Say amen. Amen. Immediately following this service, we'll be uh, going to the Montefiore Cemetery uh, in northeast of Philadelphia. The family will then return uh, after the interment to the, uh, the Loeb residence on Barwin and here in um, Wynwood. And we'll have services morning and evening there, eight in the morning six in the afternoon evening with the exception of shabbat when we'll have services at 7 30 in the evening nine o'clock in the morning on sunday and a short quiz will be given to you when you leave here about the times of services that's when they are at this time i would uh, ask the pallbearers to uh, come forward do we have some pallbearers you can As the mourners leave, I'll now uh, invite you to return to your cars and thank you on behalf of the family for being here this morning.